And let's take our Bibles and let's read Galatians 2 today. Galatians chapter 2. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who is with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If, while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So in these first ten verses here, I'm going to mostly focus on the second section today, but I, want, I don't want to just jump over these first 10 verses. It, uh, it, there's kind of a lot going on here, and so I kind of put together this, this paraphrase that kind of gives a little more context to what he's actually saying here. So in these first 10 verses, Paul continues to set the record straight on his credibility to preach the gospel. There was a lot of people who were charging that he was not preaching the gospel well, that he was giving only half of the gospel, and that he wasn't really even a full apostle. He was kind of a quasi-apostle, not like Peter, James, and John. So if he he was going to be writing the same sort of thing, maybe in a different way, it might say something like this. Fourteen years later, I went to Jerusalem again. Barnabas, a Jew, and Titus, a Gentile, came with me I went to present the gospel I had been preaching, but privately to those in leadership. I was concerned that I was dividing the church into a Jewish church and a Gentile church. While they were there, some fake Christians took offense that Titus was with us because he was an uncircumcised Gentile and doesn't follow the Old Testament laws of ritual cleanliness. They had an agenda to enslave all believers in Christ to the Old Testament law. 
we stood our ground because of what the gospel says. The leaders in Jerusalem, my fellow apostles, not superiors, did not give me the gospel. They agreed with everything I already teach. They didn't add or subtract anything. On the contrary, they saw that I was entrusted with the gospel just as they were. The same God was bringing the same gospel through all of us just to different audiences, they to Jews and I to Gentiles. Those pillars of faith, James, Peter, and John, they made an official agreement with Barnabas and I as co-apostles. We all agreed that Barnabas and I would go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. Their only request that we help with the many poor believers in Jerusalem, which I was happy to do. So there's more going on here. There's, this is written to people in Galatia. It kind of assumes that they know what's going on a little bit. And so this is kind of the first half. He's establishing that, no, we are apostles just like James, Peter, and John are. And in fact, we shook hands on it. We were co-apostles. We're, we're equals here. So then in the next part, this is kind of what we're going to focus more on today. Verses 11 through 21, Paul and Peter were equals so that Paul publicly rebukes Peter. He publicly rebuked Peter. Even the Apostle Peter must be corrected in the gospel. Even the Apostle Peter. He's considered uh, the first head of the church. Uh, Roman Catholics refer to him as the first pope. Even he has to be corrected. It's human nature to please people. It's human nature to uh, avoid uncomfortable situations and circumstances. And Paul doesn't do that. It's easy to take the easy way. But Paul doesn't take the easy way here. Absolutely all of us need to be challenged with the gospel. All of us do. As it says up there. This is, even Peter has to be challenged with the gospel, corrected by it. So if Peter does, then we do too. The, the one who Jesus said, on this rock I'm going to build my church... So if a fellow believer challenges you in your Christian life, maybe you don't get defensive. Maybe you need that. If a fellow believer confronts you about sin in your life, hear them out. If it's a fellow believer, assume loving concern, and unless it's proven otherwise, assume the best first. Because if we're fellow believers, then we need to have love for one another. We need to be challenging each other in the gospel and grounding one another in that. If we're straying from that, wouldn't you want somebody to kind of call that to your attention? You can call someone on their conduct without judging them. That's kind of not very popular today, but, but you can. You can call somebody on their conduct and not judge them, but be just concerned for them. You can rebuke someone and love them. Proverbs has a lot of passages on that. But it's possible for all of us to lose focus on the gospel. All of us. And so we need to be continually corrected in it. This is why the gospel is preached from this pulpit every week. Because we need to be continually reminded of what that is and continually grounded in that so that we are not straying from it. So what is this gospel? We're leading up to the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. In 1517, the church sold forgiveness in the form of indulgences. They said, if you want forgiveness, then buy this indulgence. Now, people back then, it was a very different time back then. People faced death on a daily basis. You were lucky if you made it to your fifth birthday and you were lucky if you were older, made it to be older than 60. There were lots of diseases, lots of wars, lots of persecution. And so death was constantly on your mind. And because death was constantly on your mind, your eternal destiny was constantly on your mind. And so this was something very real. You wanted to make sure that your eternal destiny was secure because you could go at any time. You never knew when some disease was going to get you or something bad was going to happen and you were going to be gone. So you need to make sure that you were right with God constantly. 
So the church taught at that time that there, were these, there was this treasury of good works, treasury of merits. And the church kind of had this. There were all these saints who've gone before us, right? And they've all done good deeds, and they had a lot of extra good deeds. And so the church kind of had these in some storehouse, and they could grant these good deeds to people for a price. And that was controlled by the Pope. The Pope had the keys to that treasury so that for people who had sinned and they need some extra good deeds and righteousness, then they could have that. At that time, the church had some big power in society. So that lots of powerful people wanted to be priests and bishops and archbishops and so forth. They weren't pious people wanting to serve the Lord. They were people who were interested in power and control. And so this was the way to do it. And so you had something called simony, where people would buy their seats in the church. So if you wanted to become a priest back then, if you had enough money, you could pay the bishop and the bishop would appoint you to be the next priest. If you wanted to be the bishop, then you pay the pope, and the pope would appoint you to be the bishop. Simony. Selling the church offices. And so lots of powerful people wanted to be priests and bishops, and they were willing to pay. It happened a lot. There was one person, his name was Albert, and he was bishop of two dioceses already. Diocese is kind of our equivalent, to, or their equivalent of our classes. He was bishop of two places already, and he wanted a third. This third one would have made him archbishop, and he wanted this really badly because this would have made him archbishop of all of Germany. So this is a pretty prized seat here. So he wanted this, but... Even when he squeezed out all the money from his two dioceses already, he didn't have enough to buy this new seat, this, to be an archbishop. He didn't have enough money, even though he squeezed all the money from the treasuries of these two dioceses that he had. So he had to take out a loan. So he did that, but he needed to pay back that loan. So he talked to the Pope. I want to buy this new seat, but um, I have to pay back this pretty hefty loan to do it. So the Pope said, how about this? I will grant you the authority to sell indulgences. And as long as I get half of that money, and you keep that other half to pay back this debt that you owe, and then you can pay for this seat. And I'll grant you that authority. Because the Pope at that time also had some agenda of his own. He was trying to rebuild this St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, which was this big fancy church, and it was kind of only half finished. That's um, Pope Leo X there. That was the Pope. So he needed money to rebuild this basilica in Rome. And so the Pope authorizes Albert to sell indulgences to pay for that archbishop office if he could get half. And because he needed that money, and he wanted to get a lot of that money, there was a lot of pressure to sell these indulgences. And so when these indulgences were being sold, they were being oversold. In fact, the theology of indulgences just reached new heights of being ridiculous here. Some of the things they were promising when they were selling indulgences for this guy, it's, they would say indulgences made sinners cleaner than when coming out of baptism. They believed in baptismal regeneration where the water actually washes away sins. So they were saying, hey, if you buy this indulgence, you'll be cleaner than you are than when you come out of baptism. They would say that it has as much power as the cross of Christ. This indulgence that you could buy has as much power as the cross itself. would say that you'd be perfectly clean even if you violated the mother of God. Just outrageous stuff. And all this is bringing in lots of money that powerful people wanted. 
This was going on when Martin Luther was a professor at the time. And he was seeing what was going on. And like Paul to Peter, Martin Luther confronted the church on the gospel. He opposed the church to its face because it was clearly in the wrong. And he nailed these 95 theses to the door of the church of Wittenberg, which is the way that you made an official challenge to something. It was a common thing to do, so it probably wasn't a very ceremonial event. He just saw something that was wrong and thought, hey, we need to correct this. What he didn't realize is that he was going to make a lot of rich and powerful people very angry. And when you make rich and powerful people angry, that usually doesn't go very well for you. When you challenge the whole system of making money, that doesn't go so well. So he just saw something that wasn't needed to be corrected, but he ended up being against the richest and most powerful people at the time. But some of these 95 theses I have up there, any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without indulgence letters. Any true Christian, whether living or dead, participates in all the blessings of Christ and the church, and this is granted him by God, even without indulgence letters. The true treasure of the church is the holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. That's what the church dispenses. The gospel. We preach the gospel. We don't have these good works of saints who have gone before us that we can just throw at other people who need them. So one of the lessons of the Reformation is something in Latin that's called sola gratia. We are saved by God's grace alone. We don't save ourselves. God saves us by grace alone. In Titus 3, 4 through 7, it says this, When the kindness and love of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. By grace we are justified, not because of the things that we had done. This is a radical idea. It kind of goes against what we live each day. Everything else in this life we have to earn, but not grace. Let's uh, respond to this question together. How are you right with God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is to accept this gift of God with a believing heart. This is a very radical idea that we are saved just by grace. That's it. All we need to do is accept this gift of God with a believing heart. That's all. We don't, we don't need to earn God's grace. We don't need to cooperate with him in any way. We are saved just by grace. That's all. And that's all we need. In verses 15 and 16, Jesus Christ is our salvation, so our faith is in him. He is where we get our salvation. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus doesn't save us most of the way or some of the way. He saves us completely. 
We do not get our salvation from the church. We do not get our salvation from saints or their good deeds or us or our good deeds. Just by grace in Christ. And in salvation, God and Christ get 100% of the credit. We can't say, well, I, I did this, therefore you owe me. There's none of that at all. God was merciful, he was gracious, and because of that, we are saved. That's all. That's, that's it. On that last day, when we stand before God, which we all will, we are going to stand there with nothing in our hands at all. Not, not just a little bit, nothing. If God, on that last day, says, why should I let you into eternal life? Your, your answer should be something like question and answer 60, which we just said. By nothing that I've done, only because of Christ and what he has done. That's, that's all we can say. Salvation is not a cooperation. It's, it's a resurrection. In Ephesians 2, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead. You had no brain waves and your heart had stopped beating. You were gone in your transgressions and sins. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So we are brought from death to life. There's no cooperation in that. God didn't need our consent. This is not where two people stand up together back to back as if we were equal with God, having to put the same force that God was putting into our salvation to make us rise. This is not even God extending a hand to us while we are down on the ground, unable to get up, that we have to take. We were dead. Unable to move at all. This is a resurrection. By grace alone, we are saved. Not by works. Nobody can boast at all. Our salvation is not a team effort. God saves us and we respond. He raises us to life. And now we live for him. That's how it works. I love that last verse that we read. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. It really puts it in an absolute way. If we, could, if we could earn righteousness by the law, then Christ died for nothing at all. His death was in vain. If we could save ourselves in any way, Christ died for nothing. If the Old Testament sacrifices and ceremonies could save us, then Christ died for nothing. If God's grace is achieved and not given, then Christ died for nothing. If being a good person could save us, Christ died for nothing. If having a good heart and good intentions could save us, Christ died for nothing. If doing any amount of good deeds at all could save us, Christ died for nothing. So if we, if we live into any of these other realities here, we're effectively saying Christ died for nothing. Jesus, I don't need you. You didn't need to go to that cross. You didn't need to die for me. I can save myself. In the Greek text of Galatians 2, there's no the in front of law. And that means he's not talking just about Old Testament law. He's talking about any law. There is no law that can save us at all. There is no code. There is no path. There are no hoops to jump through of any kind that can save us. If there were... Christ died for nothing. The 
This is an amazing thing. I don't think we get how big this is. There's nothing that we have to do. God simply loved us. That's it. And he simply raised us from death in our sins. That's it. And we now belong to him forever. That's it. And so now we live a new life because of him. That's amazing. So we don't live in a world like Martin Luther did, where the church is almighty and powerful and it's dispensing forgiveness for a price and you can buy your own church office and all of that kind of stuff. We don't live in that world anymore. And yet we still live in a world that desperately needs grace. We live in a world that desperately tries to earn salvation. We have racial groups protesting to earn validation by society. We have people who are desperately climbing the corporate ladder, working 60, 70, 80 hours a week to do so. We have people doing everything they can to earn academic scholarships, trying to get accepted into the best college possible. In sports, it's all about earning too. People cheer and money comes in only when you win, only when you perform well. And there's always winners and losers there. There's always somebody who's better. Some people will do anything to earn an approval by the group. They'll wear all different kinds of clothes, different kinds of makeup. They'll act different ways. They'll talk different ways just to try to fit in. Some people will do anything to earn love, just to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or to get married. We'll bend over backwards for that. We'll be a totally different person for that. We'll redefine our identity just so that we could have love. And this happens even to Christians too. Even Christians forget that salvation is by grace alone and we try to earn other salvations. We give our lives to earning more money. We will give our lives to succeeding in sports or gaining others' approval, or finding love. We give our lives to this stuff. We give our souls to it so that everything else gets sacrificed. And not that these things are inherently bad, but how much of our time do they get? How much of our time do we devote to winning somebody's approval or moving up a ladder or gaining more stuff or money. Hard work is good. But if we're giving our lives to another salvation, then we're saying Christ died for nothing. Jesus, you're not good enough. Now, that's nice, but I need more than that. I need to be saved in another way. I need a different kind of redemption. Yours isn't good enough. Where do you cut corners in your life? The thing that you cut corners for in your life is what you really worship. So if you're cutting corners for money, for approval, for success, for love, whatever the case may be, then that's what you worship. And if we're doing that, to the extent that we're doing that, we're saying Christ died for nothing. The gospel of grace in Christ is worth losing everything. There's nothing that compares to that. Martin Luther, at that time, he nailed those 95 theses to that door. He was an esteemed professor at a great university, and that university was funded by indulgences. He was challenging the entire system of money that paid his salary. And he angered the richest and most powerful people. When he did that, he had tons of death threats. He didn't think he was going to live very many more years at all. Somebody was going to get to him. 
He thought he was going to die. And he was spared. He happened to be in an area where the ruler liked him. But if he had been in any other area, he would not have survived. He would have been snatched up and burned at the stake. So he lost everything for challenging the church on that, for correcting it in the gospel. Paul, when he challenged Peter, he was really challenging somebody pretty important too. But after that rebuke, Peter turned around. Your Bible reading track for today is from Acts 15. This is after he was rebuked by Paul, and he stands up for the gospel. He says, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as the Gentiles are. So like Paul and Luther, we need to stand up for grace. It's something to be stand, stood up for. We need to stand up for it in our own lives first. So we are no longer saying Christ died for nothing. We need to stand up for it in the lives of others too. We need to stand up for it in the church. We need to be always corrected in the gospel that is God's grace. And wherever people are selling their souls to one law or another, of one kind or another, we need to stand up for grace and to say, no, you are saved by grace alone. All you need to do is accept this gift of God with a believing heart. And that's the gospel. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you are an amazing God who save us simply by grace alone. And Lord, we pray that we would take this grace to heart. That Lord, we would realize what kind of love this is. And Lord, that we would be inspired by that and that we would live new lives, the new lives that you've given to us, so that, more, Lord, more people would see what this grace is about, and that we would live into it even more ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.